Hello everyone, I am Nina Paul. I'm an INDS student and an elementary education student. Before I start, I just want to say thank you to my INDS advisor who helped me with my capstone along the way, Ms. Carrie Sauter, and my two faculty mentors. One could not be here today, but one is Barbara Warren in the back there. And then during the implementation of my capstone project, I also had help from teachers in practice, and that would be Gretchen Gray and Christina Merle. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped me. So before we start, I was wondering if you ever thought about what actually goes on in a fourth grade classroom today, specifically a math classroom. You may remember when you were in school, flashcards, or writing in journals, or a lot of note remote memorization. But today things look a little bit different. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is computational thinking in elementary education. So you may not understand what computational thinking is or what it has to do with elementary education. So I'm going to break that down for you a little bit. One of the pioneers for computational, computational thinking was Jeanette Wing. She's a corporate VP in Microsoft and she's also a dean in, of computer science at Carnegie Mellon, and she defines computational thinking as solving problems by drawing, con by drawing on concepts fundamental to computer science. So basically what that means is using computer science background to solve problems. And um, some of the words that you'll hear pop up are words like algorithm and coding, because those are the things that underlie, are underlying in computer science. So now, how, are, how is computer science relevant to elementary education? Now because I was in a fourth grade classroom, it wouldn't be the computer science that you may see in a college course today or when one of your coworkers are coding. But what we used right here is a program called Scratch. And um, you probably can't see from back there, but that's a Frozen character. That's uh, Anna from Frozen. And she has different angles. She'll turn right or left. And we're using this in a fourth grade classroom to learn about angles. So because algorithms break things down, um, coding and computer science breaks things down into algorithms, which means a step-by-step -step process, we could use a step-by-step -step process to learn math. And the program we use for that is Scratch. So here's the actual thing that the students did. You'll notice up top that there's some levels. This is only the second level, where they just have to create this right angle. Um, and for their project, they had to move forward by however many pixels to reach this point right there. Then they had to turn right or left by whatever degrees. And by the time they reach level 10 or 11, they have these intricate mazes that they have to go through using their knowledge of angles. And eventually, at the end of the implementation of my project, they had to create their own maze using angles. So the research question question that I had for my project was, can the creation of a computer science inspired math unit for elementary school students contribute to their development of higher order thinking skills, which is something de um, defined by Bloom's revised taxonomy. So this is the taxonomy right here. It starts from, with remembering, and remembering means um, kind of facts-based things that you may remember doing in school. Um, and creating means something that you do on your own that you're totally responsible for that knowledge. Um, and I'll go into those in a little bit more detail in my thesis statement. So my thesis was using the stem prompts derived from Bloom's revised taxonomy when creating a computer science inspired math unit for elementary school students contributes to students' development of higher order thinking skills. So you'll notice on here, this is the top half of Bloom's taxonomy. There's analyze, evaluate, and create, and I just popped out a couple of the ones that I used when I was teaching those lessons. Um, so this, what is the function of? So when we're learning about coding, we want to know what those different tools are in the classroom. So I talked about that, but analyzing, finding the errors, because you have to do a lot of troubleshooting, debugging, and designing your own way, which is what I talked about earlier, where they had to make their own maze at the end. Now these are the questions that fall into that higher order thinking skills or critical thinking that's at the top part of Bloom's taxonomy. Now some of the disciplines that went into me creating this project were psychology, math, and computer science, primarily disciplines for our content, and then education is more of a field, but it had a heavy um, part in my capstone project, so I wanted to include that in my perspectives. There's a lot of different things that I could pull from these disciplines, primarily from psychology, 
I pulled Piaget's theory of intellectual development and I got Pia's theory of fractal development. Piaget's theory of intellectual development talks about what kids can do at certain stages. And I had a literature review where I learned that just because a kid is in a stage doesn't mean it can't do, um, he or she can't do abilities above or beyond that stage that they're in. But I got Pia's theory of fractal development helps as an educator to know where students can learn next, where they are and what they need just to be pushed right beyond. This right here, Scratch, is a program that we used for our coding project in my classroom. And then the concepts of coding and algorithm also played in. From math, some of the big ideas were developing that number sense of understanding whether 90 degrees would be a right angle and all of those things, angles themselves and algorithms. And you'll notice algorithms are in both computer science and math, which is one of the ways that I use my integrative strategy, strategy to bridge the two. And then in education, I took some pedagogy, some teaching strategies from both math and computer science, and I used Bloom's taxonomy, which is that triangle that you saw in the previous slide. So my integrative approach, I had two integrative approaches that I combined, I had organization and redefinition, to really understand this term algorithms. So with organization, I took that commonality between math and computer science of problem solving and the way that they approach problem solving to pull that term algorithm. Um, and because computer science is inherently based on math, I could say that I could, algorithms are also a part of computer science. And then in redefinition, math uses algorithms for computation and proofs and computer science uses it to solve a problem, whatever program they're given. And both of those approaches are step-by-step -step approaches. Even though they're not being used in the same way in math and the same way in computer science, they're still the same idea that, they're moving, that you're moving step-by-step. -step. Now, my methodology. To start my research, I first conducted a literature review. So my literature review, I took different sources from the professors that I had here from UMBC, recommendations. And then I looked at those journals with these three different journals with a couple of different search terms to help me really hone in on what I wanted to review. So the things that I was really looking for was Bloom's taxonomy and Piaget's theory of intellectual development. Those are, I wanted to know what the criticisms were of Bloom's taxonomy because when I implemented it in my classroom, I wanted to make sure I was using it correctly. And I wanted to know what my students were developmentally ready for because coding is such a big idea and it's something that um, is more prevalent in high school, implementing it in a fourth grade classroom seemed to be a bigger deal, and I wanted to make sure that my students were able to do that. So I did conduct my literature review, and then I had this experimental design where I went into a Howard County classroom, a fourth grade Howard County classroom, and I conducted these lessons with the help of my um, teaching mentors. They went over my lessons, and there was four different lessons that I did, and I did a pre-assessment at the beginning, and a post-assessment at the end to see what knowledge the students have gained over the course of those four days. Um, and I'm going to talk about those results in a later slide. So, the so my interdisciplinarity was instrumental, which means that it was a practical problem solving approach. Um, I did research across those disciplines and I actually conducted this experiment. So now my results. So Bloom's taxonomy, a lot of educators, a lot of researchers had um, mentioned that these levels may not necessarily be starting at remembering, moving to creating, because students can operate at different levels, at different stages. So keeping that in mind, I knew I could integrate a couple of these into my lessons day by day. Um, and I knew not to limit my students to, and let them roam wherever their mind would take them. And for Piaget's theory on intellectual development, the sensory motor, my students would be in the pre-operational stage. And in the pre-operational stage, they're able to do things concretely if they had visuals, which the Frozen project that we were doing did, they would be able to do this coding. But they may not be able to work in C++ or Python or Java or some of those more advanced programming skills because those are a little bit more abstract. Now, in my actual experiment itself, when I performed my statistical analysis, there was no statistical significance, which <coughs> meant that the research that I was doing and the research, um, the, my control group and my test group had the same results. They started 
around the same place and they ended around the same place, which means they both made gains, but one didn't prove to have a higher gain than the other. But there are still some gains qualitatively, because my students were able to learn coding in those four days in addition to learning angles. And there is also some room for fu uh, future research that I was able to gain from implementing this study. So some of the big ideas across this capstone were digital literacy, improving STEM proficiency, having engagement and enjoying, enjoyment, and building confidence in problem solving. Using these coding lessons, we were building digital literacy. Students were more exposed to computers. Students were more exposed to um, manipulating programming, and so on and so on. STEM proficiency, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. By doing coding, inherently they were working on their technology, engineering, and because they were angles coding, their math skills as well. Other studies, um, the study by, done by Merle Duarte, showed that engagement and enjoyment were one of the byproducts of using technology and coding in a classroom. And then confidence in problem solving skills was one of the things that these researchers in Turkey noticed. And they ran a study that was very similar to mine. But one of the additional observations they were able to collect was that their students' confidence increased. So in conclusion, I want to revisit my research question. Can the creation of a computer science-inspired math unit for elementary school students contribute to the development of their higher order thinking skills? as defined by Bloom's taxonomy. And I'm left with maybe, because my research showed that there was no statistical significance, but it didn't show that there was, um, that the students declined in their scores, or that they improved. And my study was so small scale, because it was one fourth grade classroom in Howard County, that there's vast possibilities to answer this research question. And some possibilities could be special education, in student engagement across grade levels and with a larger sample. Any questions? Questions from the floor. So um, you talked a lot about your students' experience in this mm -hmm. lesson, um, but as a teacher, so one of your main functions is to kind of keep the space and the attention mm -hmm. um, of your students in their learning. So. Did you find it easier using these computer programs, or what kind of challenges did that present to you in that regard? That's a great question. So for some of my students, because all students are different, this worked really well, which is why I pointed out special education as one of the future research poss <coughs> possibilities. A lot of the students with individualized education plans, they were a lot more engaged than some of the other students. And then some students who were inherently into technology, into coding, who were love doing it all the time, they were also really into them. And then other students, I had done this survey at the end, uh, more students could tell me if they liked coding, if they actually learned through coding, if they would do it again. And all the students said they learned through coding, but they may not, and some of the students said they may not necessarily do it again to learn from again. So some of them really enjoyed it, and then some of them didn't, which I think you'll find in a lot of classrooms. Anyway. Now that you know where you're going to be teaching in January, yes. congratulations, yes. Um, what are you going to take with you from this project? What's like one big kernel that you take? So one of the cool things that I found during my, um, before I graduate in the elementary education program, you have to do a teaching internship. And so during my teaching internship, one of my mentors has this coding program that was very easy to integrate into um, math lessons every day. And because the school I'm going to teach at also is a huge coding school, it's one of the schools where um, that's something that's important to them. Taking the idea, I shared my capstone with them, I talked to them about the different things that I researched and that how I could, instead of taking time, because time is really precious in any classroom, instead of taking time aside just to teach coding, the way I can integrate it into different content um, was something that I think I'll take into my classroom and that they really enjoyed that I could take into my classroom. Okay, so this is so not a trick question. I'm asking you to teach me something I don't know. I didn't understand what you're saying about Piaget's theory, the idea that on the one hand it clearly defines levels, and on the other hand those levels don't necessarily apply. Yes, <laughs> I need to be confusing. So, 
some of the levels that I'm, when I was thinking and trying to communicate that, a child is on a sensory motor stage, which means a child from like zero to two wouldn't be able to operate on the same um, scale as a child who was in concrete operational, who could manipulate things, who could walk, stand, you know, is reasoning abstractly with the world. Um, so in that case, they wouldn't necessarily overlap. But then some students in my classroom, where I was really looking at that gap where it could cross two levels, is um, mine were sensory motor, and they could, some of them could possibly also reason abstractly without those visuals. So when they were creating their final project on that Friday, that was a day that I could see whether they were able to, you know, start reasoning abstractly. But it may not be something that I necessarily expect. The general, um, like the average student will most likely not be able to reason abstractly, but just because P Piaget's theory tells me that they're not going to doesn't mean that all of them won't. So I wanted to give them that ability to, so it can use across the levels. Yes. Yeah, building off of that, how do you differentiate for students that are on different levels with a computer program that is, I think, basically just for one so, so um, this is something that of, we didn't do all four days. It was one of the, one of the projects that we did. Um, and for students here, there's a couple of different things that we could do. There's you may not see it here because the way I cropped it, but there's a listening, an audio um, that goes along with this that will give students directions. There's this little tutorial that we'll walk through students through which I did not tell every student that they had because I didn't want them to take the easy way out. So there are some students that I did tell. And then there's also this that allows students to move faster or slower. Um, and then they also move at their own pace. So some students didn't get to level 10, and some students did, and that was okay because as I was walking around, I could just see if students were engaged, if they were really trying, and that's honestly all that I cared about, that they were able to really move through that critical thinking with their problems wrong problem solving and productively struggle through these. Did you find that you, you could improve that program in any way? That's an interesting question. That is something I would consider. It would be, um, if I could, I think this would be a very cool thing to take into, there's not, it's very limited the amount that I can do with coding. Um, there's like fraction stuff and angle stuff, but it would be very cool to put it into like adding, subtracting across content. And if you were talking about differentiating things that I would add for that, um, even bigger text, because some of these are small, it's kind of hard to see. Um, and reading these out would probably be things that I would add to this. I can't resist them, plug It'll be interesting to see what you thought of Shelley's paper when you handed yours in and all the stress <laughs> behind you. See about that culturally responsive to look for this sort of connection. It 